All right, so we are recording now. So welcome back, everyone. Um, there's a like 20, 20 ish slides left to go, and then we're done with the lecture for today. Um, so um, I, I hope everyone's still awake, actually. So if you're still awake, just throw something in chat. Like I know that people like it's one of these things that if you're doing these lectures live, then I can see people falling asleep or saying no I already know this please just skip this part and and that's one of the things that like I'm missing now right like I I, I only see myself talking into a microphone and, and the slides and um, I, I, I I don't have that much uh, um, feedback and it's nice to when when you're doing lectures live you have the feedback and, and people can comment and um, but and we have to use the chat for that so um, if you're still awake, then just throw something in chat, or um, subscribe, or, or like, or just do an animated GIF, or whatever, um, just so that I know that I'm not just talking to myself for the, for the last hour. Um, and I know it's not the most interesting lecture by going through all of the different sequencing technologies, but uh, um, yeah, at least you guys can do it from home, right? You can just lay in bed and, and, and watch it. All right. Alexander's still awake, Commander's still awake, Sandra's still here. Hey Sandra, um, it, did you already come at the beginning of the lecture or are you just tuning in now? So, <laughs> Alright, good. So at least we still have three people who are awake, so I'm not doing it just for myself and for the people that will watch it later. Um, but yeah, it's nice to have a little bit of feedback and hey, I'm doing this for you guys, so if, if you guys have very specific questions or things that you want to know, just uh, just let me know. All right, so sequencing, we've talked a lot about it. Um, it is a key to biology nowadays. So without sequencing, um, nowadays biological research uh, will uh, would be impossible. There's many techniques. Um, we discussed a whole bunch of them, but there's many, many more. Like I could fill just a whole lecture, three hours just from um, just talking about different sequencing techniques, but that would not be fun for me or fun for you guys. So, um, ah, here's since minute one. Very good, Sandra. Very good. I hope you're enjoying the lecture. Um, so um, there's a lot of techniques, um, and a lot are still based on on PCR and amplification. Um, and and the the problem with sequencing is that there's a complex computational pipeline that that you get after you get your sequencing read. So the part in the lab is is very small compared to the part that a, bio, a bioinformatician needs to do afterwards. So some of the things that are already possible or possible in the near future is single cell sequencing. Um, people are working on being able to get DNA from a single cell and sequence that. Um, and, and even single DNA molecule sequencing like the PAC bio um, is getting more and more possible every day. Um, so we're at the, the, the techniques and, and are getting better and better every day. So when I do it next year, there will probably be another couple of new novel sequencing techniques that are more interesting. All right, so I wanted to talk to you about gene structure because when we're talking about a gene, um, there's two different, very, very different definitions of gene. So in the previous lecture, when we talked about a gene, right, when we talked about um, how Mendel saw a gene or um, um, how um, Thomas Hunt Morgan saw a gene, and then we were talking about a unit of inheritance. So something which is like a bead, uh, which is inherited from parent to uh, to children. However, in molecular biology, if you're talking to a molecular biologist, you're talking, so the, the, the previous lecture was like a geneticist. So someone who does genetics will see a gene as a unit of inheritance. Um, but in molecular biology, a gene is a union of a genomic sequence encoding a coherent set of fun potentially fun overlapping functional products. Um, and it's a completely different definition. Um, and um, I just want to to show you how a molecular biologist thinks about a gene um, instead of a, a, a geneticist. I'm coming more from a genetics point of view, so for me a gene is something that is inherited and has certain properties and, and causes certain phenotypes, uh, but in molecular biology a gene is, is a, a union of genomic sequences, so DNA sequencing, uh, which encodes a coherent, a coherent set, um, so a set of proteins um, which, um, which can be even 
overlapping, but have like a, a certain functional product. So when we talk about a gene structure, there are two different types of gene structure. So there's the gene structure for bacteria, also called pro, uh, prokaryotes, um, and the, the prokaryotes um, are encoding genes in a different way compared to eukaryotes, so compared to humans and mice. Um, so a very quick overview on how it looks, like we will talk about RNA and translation, um, but if you look at the, the the, the DNA of a bacteria, then a DNA, uh, the DNA of the bacteria genes are coded in something which is called a polycystronic operon, um, which means that you have like a regulatory sequence um, and another regulatory sequence, and this regulatory sequence consists of enhancers, so things which when a protein binds there will enhance or will silence the production of a gene or of this operon. Um, then we have an operator and a promoter. So uh, these three things are in the regulatory sequence, and then you still have the five prime UTR, so the five prime untranslated region of the mRNA, um, and then you have something which is called an ORF, an open reading frame. And this open reading frame actually encodes the protein. Um, so uh, the protein coding, uh, like normally people say, or people used to say that there was a lot of junk DNA, DNA which did nothing. It didn't encode for proteins and people didn't really know what it did. Um, but nowadays we know that like a lot of the DNA is actually in these regulatory sequences, so it actually has a regulatory function on the transcription of proteins or of messenger RNA, which then eventually code for proteins. Um, but in a bacteria, if you look at a prokaryotic gene structure, these things or multiple ORFs are usually transcribed on the same mRNA. So when you look at the DNA, you have some enhancers or operators and some promoters, so things which determine if the gene is going to be transcribed and how it is going to be transcribed. Then you have the 5' prime UTR, which contains the ribosomal binding site, and then you have something which is called an ORF, so an open reading frame where the, the the three letter codon comes from. So hey, you have three DNA bases which code for a, for a single amino acid. And in bacteria, these things are generally stacked together. So you can have a single messenger RNA, which is not really a messenger RNA in a in a bacteria, um, because it's generally directly transcribed at the point where it is, uh, so the, the translation in a bacteria more or less happens at the point where the transcription occurs, um, So, but you get a, a something which is called an mRNA, it's it's an RNA, it's an intermediate, it's a messenger, but it's not like in a human cell where it's transported outside of the nucleus, um, because bacteria don't have a nucleus. But there's different, there's, there's two or three or four or five proteins encoded on a single mRNA. So bacteria um, generally transcribes multiple genes in one go. Um, so in that, this is called a polycystronic operon, um, so uh, there's many open reading frames which encode different proteins. And all of these things have their own ribosomal binding site, so if you would have something which looks like this, and then there would be two ribosomes attaching to this mRNA when it is produced, and then they start pro producing two different proteins. Um, and this is different from how uh, eukaryotic cells work, because in eukaryotic cells um, you have something which looks like this, um, so you have still a regulatory sequence at the beginning, which can have like again enhancers and promoters, which is then split into a proximal and a core part, and then you have your 5' prime UTR, but then you have your open reading frame. And the main difference between the, op between the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes is, is that in eukaryotes a single open reading frame is encoding for more or less a single protein. So there's no uh, many proteins on a single messenger RNA like there is in bacteria. One of the other features which is very different from, um, from bacteria is that the open reading frames in, uh, in eukaryotic cells have um, introns and exons. So that means that there are little parts which are not coding for protein inside the different protein protein coding parts. So when the DNA is transcribed or translated into mRNA, um, the mRNA still contains these intronic parts. So the whole 
part, so from the 5 prime UTR all the way in the back to the 3 prime UTR is transcribed on the mRNA and then there's something which is called post-transcriptional modification in which the introns are removed and then we have the protein coding region um, kind of being formed from the from the uh, from the intron exon structure. Um, one of the other things which happens in the post-translational modification in eukaryotic cells is that there's a poly A tail added to the end of the mRNA. Um, so we will talk about m talk about this more when we talk about the RNA part of the lecture. Um, but there's a there, there's a difference. So there's a little five prime cap being added. Then you have the five prime UTR. Then you have the protein coding region, and then you have the three prime UTR, which doesn't code for a protein, but generally has like a leader sequence or a, a, a targeting sequence. And then you have the poly A tail. So the poly A tail is kind of instructing the ribosome to make multiple proteins of the same mRNA because it would be really u uh, wasteful that if you need like a thousand proteins to have to produce a thousand uh, messenger RNAs, right? Because then you have to transcribe the same gene a thousand times. Um, so in eukaryotic cells, the way that they kind of solve this is by doing post-translational modification and adding a poly A, -A tail. So the longer the poly A tail, the more or the, the more often the same mRNA will be transcribed into proteins. So in eukaryotic cells, a single mRNA is carrying a single protein, but this protein can, for example, be transcribed 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times, so that hey, you don't have to make, a th or that there's no need to make 1,000 uh, mRNAs. Hey, while in bacteria, this does not occur. There is no poly A tail in bacteria, so bacteria, one messenger RNA codes for two proteins, which can be two different pro or which are generally two different proteins. Um, in a eukaryotic gene structure, there only one protein coding region, but this can be transcribed multiple times depending on the length of the poly A tail. All right, so a slightly different gene structure. So hey, if you if you get a question on the exam, like what is the main difference be, between a eukaryotic gene and a prokaryotic gene, then hey, one of the answers is, well, the uh, eukaryotic gene uh, encodes for a protein but has introns and exons in there, while a bacteria has no introns and exon structure. It just has the whole protein as one single kind of unit, um, while a prokaryotic, uh, uh, while a eukaryotic gene um, will have these intronic sequences, so sequences which still need to be removed from the mRNA before the protein is produced. And of course, these have a function as well, but we will talk about that when we talk about the RNA lecture. All right, so when we look at gene structure, we have a very major difficulty in defining what is exactly a gene. Yeah, because um, a gene is a unit of inheritance, um, but there's also some parts of RNA inheritance. Um, hey, we can have gene fusions, hey, which are genes next to each other um, that produce a single mRNA leading to a non-functional fusion protein. It sometimes happens that that's the case, that, hey, that something in the translation goes wrong and instead of transcribing a single mRNA, actually two mRNAs are produced and then the proteins that are made are actually fused together, um, so they, they don't work. Um, and there's also something that is called uh, interchromosomal promoter regions, and that is, for example, that the promoter of a gene is actually not located in front of the gene, but is located on a completely different chromosome. And that is, of course, because when you think about DNA, and people always think about DNA in chromosomes, and chromosomes are independent units, but that's not really the case, because in a 3D structure, uh, chromosome 3 can be very could be very close to chromosome 7, while chromosome 5 and chromosome 6 could be very far apart. Um, so had, there's, there's a lot of evidence that nowadays in, 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 in when you look at how a gene is transcribed and how a protein is made, uh, that in some cases that a promoter on chromosome 1 can drive the expression of a gene on chromosome 3, for example. And then there's also a couple of uh, examples where, for example, exons are located on different chromosomes. So instead of just making a single mRNA going on a single chromosome, and so going on the DNA, um, it actually switches chromosomes. And that is, that, it, that is for example, seen in, in mitochondria. And we will talk about that later. Yeah, but it, defining what is a gene 
um, for a geneticist is very easy. It's a unit of inheritance, but for someone who does molecular biology, it's much harder. Um, and I just wanted to kind of make that point. So when you look at the structure of a gene, of course, a gene is composed of multiple protein domains. And when we talk about the protein lecture, uh, we will go back and talk about all of the different domains that you have. Um, but protein domains, like you have things like alpha helices and beta sheets, and you have leucine zippers, and a eh, protein can be an immunoglobin-like, eh, or it can be a zinc finger protein, which binds DNA to drive transcription um, and, and the nice thing is that using bioinformatics you can look at the sequence the, so the DNA sequence and then predict some of these protein domains by just using your computer so without having to do any experiments in the lab so um, and uh, all of these protein domains we will talk about in the in the protein lecture so when we talk about gene structure, then we talk, for a bioinformatician, one of the main tasks is to take a DNA sequence and then um, predict what are genes or where are the genes. So, and you can do that in different ways. One of these is, is up initio, um, using known sig signals. So, for example, when we talk about prokaryotes, um, have we have a very... Um, a very basic structure in a way huh, because there's just a, a promoter and then there's the there's the protein coding part and then you have another promoter and then you have another or then you have a, a, a little uh, ribosomal binding site and then you have another uh, protein coding gene so in proca prokaryotes it's relatively easy to predict where the genes are and what the proteins are that these things are coding for. But it is very difficult when you look at eukaryotes, especially because in eukaryotes genes can be very complex. You have introns and exons, and so you, you, it's much harder to predict um, how a gene will look just based on the up initio. So based on the DNA sequence, it's sometimes very hard to predict um, where the genes will be in a eukaryote. It's much easier in a prokaryote. And of course, hey, you can use things like machine learning. So you can take like um, 10,000 known genes and how they are coded. You can train a machine learning algorithm for that. And then hey, you can then use this trained model to do novel gene prediction. So, but this only predicts genes which are already looking like genes which we know are there. Um, and this is the same when you do comparative gene finding. So for example, when we first had the mouse genome sequence published, and then most of these genes in the mouse genome were annotated based on genes that were already found in humans. And so this is comparative gene finding. So we use the conservation between, for example, mouse and humans to say, well, hey, in humans we know that there's a gene which goes for um, immunoglobin, and um, this immunoglobin gene, we're just looking at the sequence that humans use and then we look at mouse and if we find a sequence which looks very similar then we just assume that this also um, codes for immunoglobin. Um, so and there's th three different ways of detecting genes. Up in each show is just looking at the DNA sequence and then looking for known signals like a data box or um, a ribosomal binding site. Um, machine learning nowadays is used a lot to predict genes and of course you can use comparative gene finding um, to take the genes that are already known in for example humans and then look at the mouse or a rat or a, a monkey and then use the knowledge that you have from humans to find similar sequences um, in, in your target species. All right, so like I told you at the very, very beginning is that one of these things that I, that I like a lot is transposable elements. And transposable elements are very important when you are studying plants um, because in plants um, they are ubiquitous. There's thousands and thousands of transposable elements in a normal plant genome. Um, and the nice thing about transposable elements um, is that they are also called jumping genes. Um, and they are genes which more or less jump around. So a transposon is a little piece of DNA which has the ability to either like duplicate itself so it can jump from one part of the genome into another part of the genome. And this was discovered in 1948. So again, if you think about the timeline that we just talked about, this is actually before the discovery of DNA. So we already knew that there were parts of the genome which could jump around um, without knowing how the structure of DNA looked like. So we knew that DNA was 
was there, right? Because we already in 1848 knew that there was something called nuclein. Um, but hip before the DNA helix was discovered, uh, Barbara McClintock in 1948 discovered that there were parts of this nuclein which could kind of copy themselves into a different position on this, this nuclein. Um, and of course these transposons are very important because transposons can disrupt genes. If you have a transposon located here in a region where there is no gene um, and here in blue you have the regions which code for genes then of course when a transposon jumps into a gene uh, then it can disrupt the gene. So it can kind of silence a gene or make a gene completely non-functional by just jumping from um, uh, one position to the other. And actually uh, Barbara McClintock got a Nobel Prize in 1983, the year that I was born, uh, for her discovery of, of jumping genes. And um, um, like she has a very interesting life. So if you want to read something um, and read about scientists and, and what they did, then, then read up on Barbara McClintock. Um, she's one of my favorite scientists. Uh, but there are more, so we will we will discuss more famous scientists. Uh, but uh, yeah, Nobel Prize 1983. So um, uh, just a tip: I like Nobel Prize winners. So I there's generally like a question in the exam about who won the Nobel Prize for medicine in 1983 or something like that. So just a tip for when you're doing the exam: that learn some of the Nobel Prize winners that are in the slides. So transposable elements come in two different forms. So you have class 1 transposable elements and class 2 transposable elements. Class 1 transposable elements are also called retrotransposons. So a retrotransposon looks a little bit like a virus. Um, it, it's the same way that retroviruses work, so a little bit like things like HIV. Um, and that means that they, they are located somewhere in the DNA and then when they are transcribed into RNA, then this RNA is using reverse transcriptase to go back to DNA. So it is, um, it, it has an RNA intermediate. Um, the class two transposons, which are DNA transposons, they do a direct copy of themselves. Um, so they, there's no RNA involved, um, but they use a protein called transposase to kind of help them jump around into the genome. So and class one is um, a, a gene which needs to be transcribed in, or is it is a is a transposable element which needs to be transcribed into RNA and then rolls back using reverse transcriptase, while a class two uh, trans uh, class two DNA transposal makes a direct copy of itself using transposase. So if we look at the class 1 retrotransposon, so have, for example we have a retrotransposon here, um, so the, the, the standard DNA machinery comes along and it says, oh okay, I see a, a binding site, so the polymerase binds and it, it transcribes uh, the uh, retrotransposon into RNA. Um, and then hey, you get this formation of this uh, ribonucleon protein complex which is then reverse transcribed and then of course hey, the RNA that has been transcribed is transcribed into DNA and then this DNA can integrate at a random position into the genome and it can integrate um, within a gene disrupting genes um, in the neighborhood. So it's, it's, a, it's a piece of DNA which through RNA jumps back into the DNA um, and this is more or less similar to how HIV uh, copies itself around. Um, so if you look at the class 2 DNA transposons then uh, they look a little bit like this. So this is one specific type, the Marier, uh, Mariner type. Um, and this is, uh, you have here the, the transpos transposase which is encoded onto the transposon. Um, so how, what happens is that you have these tear molecules binding at the, at the edges. Uh, the tear molecules then bind together causing this loop of DNA and then they cut the DNA, of course the DNA is then um, um, fused back together by DNA repair mechanisms um, and then had this, this, um, this complex with the little piece of DNA, so with the transposon in there, um, is then moving to a different site in the target DNA and it, it recognizes a specific motif and then like rolls back into the DNA. So it, it, it's a direct DNA copy without a, an RNA intermediate. So, 
very interesting elements and of course in plants uh, they are very very in, uh, very important because since plants cannot really move um, they can't really uh, make variation right genetic variation is something that you need to generate to stay alive um, yeah, because you need to adapt to changing circumstances and of course a plant can't just decide to move somewhere else or to mate with with some other plant no because plants are generally close by the, the chances of plants inbreeding is really high and um, so to kind of combat this inbreeding and dying out because of inbreeding plants use these trans transposons uh, to generate sequence variety by just copy and pasting parts of their genome all over the place um, and then hoping that, that these new pieces of DNA will integrate in such a way that they will have like advantages or disadvantages. All right, so um, when we talk about transposable elements, we don't talk just about class one and class two. There's actually a s other subdivision. So you can have autonomous, so transposons which move by themselves. So they carry the transposase or they carry the reverse transcriptase in there. Um, and um, you have also non-autonomous uh, transposable elements which require uh, the presence of another transposable element to move. Um, so for example, these are transposable elements which do not encode reverse transcriptase. So they, they depend on another transposable element to, to bring in the reverse transcriptase gene when we talk about class one. Or they are transposable elements which don't have the transposase gene. So when we talk about class two. And of course, here you can say we have uh, autonomous class one, autonomous class two, non-autonomous class one, not on it. So had the, you can mix and match these things together. Um, so there's actually four types of, of transposable elements. Um, all right, hope that's clear. Whew. All right, almost there. A couple of slides to go, six, seven slides, and then we're done for today. Um, I've been talking a lot, so I'm getting a little bit of a dry throat, but I'm hoping that you can bear with me for the last uh, six, seven slides. So when we talk about regulatory elements in the DNA, um, then uh, a regulatory element is a segment of a DNA molecule which is capable of increasing or decreasing the expression of a specific gene within an organism. Right, so it's a, it's a part of the genome where a protein can bind and when the protein binds um, it either activates the expression of a gene or it represses the, the expression of a certain gene. Yeah, because normally when you look at a gene and then a, this, is, this is just a strand of DNA um, and then here we have the proximal promoter elements and this is um, usually the direct regulation of the gene yeah, so proteins bind here here you have the core promoter. So the core promoter is where the, uh, the RNA polymerase binds to start the transcription of the gene. And then the proximal promoter elements are the things which are within like 1000 base pairs of the start of the gene. Yeah, so these are relatively easy to detect. Uh, and these are generally like, oh, if you're a brain cell, yeah, then you need to be active. If you're a muscle cell, then this gene does not need to be active. So these are kind of the, the, the uh, regulators which are um, directly saying be transcribed or not be transcribed and the core promoter is more or less the promoter element um, where um, and the, the RNA polymerase binds and then you have all of these additional parts which are like insulators um, which make sure that the expression of one gene does not exp affect the expression of another gene um, and you have silencers and enhancers which will kind of fine-tune the regulation of a certain gene um, and that that's of course so these things the proximal promoter elements are generally for um, regulation on a cell type level while these distal regulatory elements are generally more for the fine-tuning so they are based on um, signals from the outside of the cell, right? So hey, I'm a brain cell, so I need to produce a certain protein because I'm a brain cell, so that's regulated here. And then, well, but currently um, it's very warm outside or the, the, the temperature is high, so I need to produce like a little bit more of the heat shock proteins uh, compared to like five minutes ago. And these things are kind of regulated more distally, so farther away from the gene. 
Um, so hey, when we talk about these things, then we talk about cis. Cis means that it's located nearby the start of the gene. Um, and then we talk about distal, which is around minus 200 base pairs. We talk about proximal, uh, which is like 500 to 200 base pairs in front of the start of the gene. And then we talk about the core, and the core is more or less um, like surrounding the start of the gene. So from like 40 base pairs into the gene to like 50 base pairs in front. And then when we talk about trans, then we talk about the distal regulatory elements. So these are located far away and can even be located on a different chromosome. All right, so um, some regulatory elements that um, people, or that I think that, that you should be aware of. Um, um, one of the most famous regulatory elements is the Tata box, um, which is the also called the goldberg hochner Hotchness box, um, and the Tata box is uh, present in around 24% of the human genes. Um, so this is of course a core element, and because here the Tata box is at like minus 30 base pairs compared to where the, the transcription, uh, transcription start site is, um, and um, the sequence of it is TA, T, and then three A's, so not Tata, but Tata, um, and uh, it, it it is the place where the main uh, transcription factor binds. So Tata is bound by the transcription factor and uh, this then pushes the polymerase to start transcription of the gene. Um, so a very important um, kind of telltale sign and uh, this sequence of course is something that you can easily find in the DNA just using standard bioinformatics tools. So if you just want to say well I want to predict genes um, and you see the sequence TA, TAAA, -A -A, uh, then you know, okay, so 30 base pairs after this sequence, there will be a gene. Um, and that if you just ha have this simple like detection algorithm saying that, well, if I find this sequence in my DNA, 30 base pairs later, there will be a gene, uh, then you can kind of catch 24% of all human genes because all if you look at the genome and all genes that we know of, uh, and then around 25%, like one in four genes will have one of these data boxes uh, in, in there. Of course, there's many, many regulatory elements, and I'm not going to talk about all of them because, again, that will be a lecture on its own. So if, if you want and hey, if you're interested in like regulatory elements and how they regulate DNA, then um, um, and how you can use them for like the prediction of genes or looking at like um, species specificity of genes, uh, then we can talk, make a lecture about all of these regulatory elements. But uh, I, I, I just want to name a few. So frame shift elements are elements which cause a small frame shift. They are m used by viruses in uh, the coronavirus. There's a frame shift element in the um, polymerase that the, the, that the virus uses. Um, we have, for example, things like internal ribosome entry sites, um, which kind of signify where the ribosome should start binding and where it should start pulling the RNA through um, the, the ribosome to make a protein. Um, we have something called an iron response element because, of course, regulation of iron and lead and cadmium and all of these like heavy metals um, within a cell are very important. So when like the um, if you have an iron response element, then this is a, a messenger RNA which kind of has kind of an iron sensor on there. So when the iron concentration goes up, um, the iron response element catches one of these um, iron molecules and then the RNA is transcribed. So it is kind of messenger RNA which is produced in large amounts and is just waiting there in the cell to catch an increase of iron to be really quick to respond to an in or a decrease of iron. Uh, we have things like leader peptide sequences which are sequences um, which uh, target a protein to be either in the nucleus or in the cell wall or in the endoplasmatic reticulum. Um, we have pyrolysine insertion sequences, we have riboswitches, RNA thermometers and uh, selenocysteine insertion sequences. So all of these sequences they have known um, DNA sequences. So hey, we can use these to predict where there are genes on the genome um, by just looking at the known like sequences and then just predicting okay so if we see a leader peptide sequence then 
this has to be a gene, right? So it's just how do we find genes uh, using bioinformatics tools? Well, it's using knowledge that we have from all of these regulatory elements and then using the sequences to kind of find these sequences into the genome and then saying, well, if we find a leader peptide, then it has to be a protein coding part. All right, so a couple of other DNA types that um, are really important and we haven't really talked about is um, DNA, which, for example, in a eukaryotic cell is not located in the nucleus. So I think that most people should know what mitochondrial DNA is, but I just want to have it mentioned. So mitochondrial DNA is DNA which is located into the my in the mitochondria. Um, it is a very small circular DNA, so it, it reminds very much of the ancestry because it is of bacterial origin and it is uh, encoding for genes which are needed in the mitochondria. So the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell and, and it's um, it's they're very important to produce energy for a eukaryotic cell. Um, so um, uh, they uh, the, the, the DNA is just inside of the mitochondria just because of the fact that uh, these proteins are needed there and hep encoding these things um, in the in the normal genome would mean that you have to transport these proteins continuously but no these are made inside of the uh, these proteins are directly made inside of the mitochondria so one of the features of mitochondrial DNA is that it's inherited from the mother um, so Generally, using mitochondrial DNA, we can track back the, the female lineage um, of, 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 of an individual. Um, however, um, it is not entirely true because um, in one in 10,000 cases, a sperm cell uh, will inject not only its DNA into an egg cell, but will also inject its mitochondria. So then you have someone who is a chimer who has two types of mitochondria. So mitochondria from the mother, who are the majority, but there will also be like mitochondria floating around from the father. And this happens around in one in 10,000 uh, fertilizations. Um, so the main goal of the mitochondrial genome is to produce ATP, the, the thing that carries energy, like the, the energy carrier um, of, um, of, of the cell. Um, and in humans, um, mitochondrial DNA encodes for 37 genes. Um, and it also encodes for its own um, um, sRNAs, right? So the, the, the 16S and the 12S, so it also codes for its own ribosome. So um, mitochondria have ribosomes themselves, which are different from the ribosomes that um, do transcription or that do uh, mRNA to protein uh, translation in the in the cytoplasm. Uh, and of course, many of these genes are um, encoded uh, for um, cytochrome oxidation and ATP synthesis, um, just because that's kind of the function. All right, one of the other th types of DNA which is often overlooked is chloroplast DNA. So chloroplast DNA is very, very important when you look at plants. So when you look at plants, um, so chloroplast DNA is found in plants and algae, and it has uh, also a bacterial origin. So um, it comes from a cyanobacteria, a cyanobacteria, um, and it is the thing that codes for the photosynthesis complex. So hey, humans don't do photosynthesis, so we don't have a chloroplast, um, but all living creatures that do um, photosynthesis, uh, they, require to, uh, they, they are required to have somewhere encoded this complex that does photosynthesis, um, and these are encoded um, on uh, the chloroplast. So here you see uh, an, an overview of the chloroplast. Again, the chloroplast comes with its own um, uh, ribosome, um, so and it comes also with its own tRNA, so it uses a slightly different codon structure than the rest of the genome of the plant, um, but it, it, the, the main thing that it does it is that it comes with uh, its own photosynthesis complex, um, yeah, but it has its own ribosomal proteins, it has its own RNA polymerase, so it is kind of a, a bacteria within a eukaryotic cell. So when you have a eukaryotic cell, it has a nucleus, but 
yeah, in plants you have the chloroplasts and these chloroplasts do photosynthesis and they come from a uh, cyanobacteria so they're kind of a, a bacteria which is incorporated into the cell just like the mitochondria is um, just to do one thing and do it well all right so that was it for today I talked to you about DNA for almost three hours. I hope you know a little bit more about DNA, uh, a little bit more about DNA sequencing, uh, about sequence alignment, which is kind of the key to how we do sequencing nowadays. So we don't use, um, we, we don't rebuild a genome from scratch every time. Hey, we use a, a reference genome and then when we sequence another animal or another animal of the same type, then we align everything to that reference. Um, I talked to you about genes, about the structure of genes, the difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Um, I talked about transposon. I talked a little bit about regulatory elements. So the only one that you really have to remember is the data box. Um, and then I talked to you about two other types of DNA which come from bacterial origin and are located in eukaryotic cells which are the mitochondria and the chloroplast. And that's it for today. So the homework for today is just a little bit of R. Um, so you will be required to install R and do a very very little bit of programming um, and of course um, if you have any questions, which I'm certain that if you've never programmed before, people will have some questions, um, then mail me. Because um, if you get stuck, then try a little bit, right? Try a little bit for yourself, like spend like 15, 20 minutes on, on solving one of the assignments. But if you get an error and you don't understand what the error means, then just send me an email. Um, one of the things that I could um, tell you in advance is um, that I on my website I have um, a, 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 a short overview of, of uh, R so it's a uh, it's a, it's like a let me look it up um, it's a little PDF file um, which has um, let me switch actually to the Firefox window so on my website you can go to here um, and then there's this PDF and I made this when I was still working in Groningen um, and it's an introduction into and a little bit of assignments for R um, so it's just a it's just a small document just 26 pages um, and it explains to you how you can install R and it shows you a little bit of how you how you can learn R so hey if you need help then you can do double question mark search term. If you want to know what a certain function does, you can use the question mark. It talks a little bit about the types of data that there are in R. So hey, it's something that if you get stuck, um, you can you can go there um, and um, you can you can just look at it. Um, so it's a, it's a something that hey, if you really want to solve the question on your own, you don't have to mail me like after 15 to 30 minutes. You can also take the, the, the R introduction PDF um, and, um, and just read a couple of pages there and see if you can find how to how to do what you want to do. Um, and of course it's a useful tool to kind of learn R on your own um, without having to follow the entire R course. Um, so the R course that I'm giving in the summer semester is based on um, this kind of tutorial that I made uh, when I was still doing my PhD when I was in Groningen. Alright, so I think that's uh, that's more or less it for today. The uh, I will just put the link in the chat so that people can just click the link, which is always easier, and that also allows people that are re-watching the stream to uh, um, click the link because the when you watch this or when you re-watch the stream on Twitch, you also get the uh, you also get the chat there. All right, so for me that's it for today. So if there are any questions, then speak up or forever be silent. Um, Skrita, thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Thank you for being here the whole lecture, actually. Uh, Testosaurus, also thank you for being here. Um, it's always nice. Um, I'm actually thinking, like, um, since I hit 50 followers, right, uh, last time. Oh, let me first stop the recording.